On February 21st, 2024, From Software and Bandai Namco Entertainment released the Shadow of the Erd Tree gameplay revealed trailer, and in a spark of inspiration, I decided that I'm going to take a shot at analyzing it in its entirety. We're going to see if I'm right or wrong come June 21st, but for now, all of this is speculation with either a lot of faith or a lot of intelligence. There's not too much arcane, however. This DLC looks to be incredibly dark. The entire trailer had a color palette that's what one could consider a much more twisted or dark version of the base game's palette. While many base game areas all used very primary and saturated colors, the Land of Shadows is dark and twisted, rotting in a way that can be reminiscent of Kaelid, except instead of Scarlet Rot being in the equation, it's Death Blight instead. If you look to the right of this legacy dungeon here, you can see what looks like dark branches sticking out from somewhere. While I don't think the land is going to be completely taken over by Death Blight, its presence is going to be felt far more here than it was in most base game areas. Death Blight was a very common issue for those who had troubles fighting Wormface and the many enemies similar to this boss. But this leech-like creature gives me a somewhat similar vibe to Wormface in its application, or perhaps importance to Death Blight. Though what we can see of its mouth and body both resemble a leech far more than a face full of worms. Though such a creature is still representative of the spread of death. Or perhaps leeches here are representative of a more medicinal application in a way. Maybe it's that they feed on the Death Blight and we simply get in the way of their hunger. I'll be expanding more on the world as a whole at the end of this video, but it is notable that the Land of Shadow seems to already fester with the consequences of Godwin's death. Early in the trailer, we see this cave interior with purple flowers, which is obviously associated with sleep. With it, we have this sleeping humanoid. Their mask is engraved with some kind of sleeping face, which could suggest that this is sort of a follower of St. Trina's. Sleep is certainly going to play a big role in this DLC, and I wonder if this is an introduction to a new enemy type. Alternatively, this may genuinely just be some random cave area, as we already know from later shots in the trailer that caves and catacombs will be making a return. With the standards we've got for a FromSoft DLC, I doubt we'll be getting many repetitive cases like in the base game, instead getting unique ones along the lines of Cave of the Forlorn. We get confirmation that this area is a cave when this very strange skeleton thing appears. We can see the same purple Trina's lilies on the floor, growing from the water. This is probably one of the weirdest enemies in the entire trailer. Being a skeleton riding a horse, wielding a weapon that almost looks like the placenta that Orphan of Kos beat you with time and time again. This being seems to be fused with its horse with its color and material being somewhat reminiscent of the quicksilver used to create the Mimic Tears. The backside of the horse seems to be melted or molding into the floor, possibly sticking to the ground. It gives off a very strong Kelpie vibe. If you don't know what a Kelpie is, it's a watery horse from Irish and Scottish folklore that lures humans to touch it. The skin of the Kelpie and the human mend together and the human is dragged beneath the waters to be drowned, melding into the horse fully. Perhaps whatever that strange obsidian-like face is caused such a thing to occur between horse and rider. This area is, I think, the biggest showcase of how different the DLC's lightings and visuals are. This place looks eerily similar to Rhea Lucaria, with what looks like glintstone hanging from the ceiling. However, this glintstone is almost purplish in color which to me implies the presence or focus of gravity magic, which we do see a bit more of later on. The architecture of this place reflects Rhea Lucaria as well. This strange person looks like some sort of reflection of Renala, though the way they're lit and presented feels almost somewhat malicious. Sort of like how Tanith is, for some reason, the first thing that came to mind when I saw them was Nishandra, a slightly taller humanoid figure who passively sat at their throne. As we see the Tarnished approach them without any cover, it seems like they'll be an NPC with some sort of quest line or task for us. As many have pointed out, they seem to be the figure depicted in the Dectus Medallion and in the Carrion Study Hall Hourglass statue. 
Whoever they are, they're a prominent figure in the Carrion world, likely some pioneer of magic. In this shot of the trailer, we see what looks like yet another Tree Sentinel-esque enemy, doing the same pose that all of them open up with when engaging with you in a fight. However, this guy's got some sort of spearheaded sword that glows with purple electricity, obviously signaling gravity magic. Rather than riding a horse, he rides a giant armored boar, giving me strong Dark Souls 1 flashbacks. Whoever he is, he's probably tied to the magic area we see earlier on. More notably, the tusks of the armored boar seem to reflect the tusks on Radon's helmet, which would make sense given the gravity connection. Let's... Well, I don't have much to say on this particular poison swamp itself. Take note of the armor being worn here. It looks like feathery wings, reminiscent of Eileen the Crow. Or alternatively, the wings of Moog as he reaches his second phase. With the DLC's darker tone, it's very likely we're going to have much more traditional, edgy looking armor and clothing, which I can't wait for. There are a couple of cool things to note in this one shot. First, we've got omen horned creatures, which I'll talk about more later. Second, we have a catacomb entrance in the background, meaning a definite confirmation of side content. Third, we've got curved swords in a reverse grip, with an Ash of War that seems to start off with a built-in dodge, not unlike Lies of P's two dragon sword. In our next shot, we've got throwing knives, which seems to have a dedicated set of movement animations rather than simply being thrown, like the default throwing knives. This is a weapon, not a consumable, which is a really cool new addition that provides more mid-range options. As we move along, I just have to point out this shot here. We've got Bloodborne-esque clothes that feel reminiscent of Blackhand Goddard from Dark Souls 3, looking like some kind of cleric-related set or possibly something like the Preceptor's altered long gown. He's doing High Monk from Sekiro. which seems like it's either going to be a new weapon class or some kind of equipable item or consumable that lets you do martial arts. It's a huge addition that I'm seriously excited for, given how much more dynamic and flexible shinobi arts are compared to a lot of Ashes of War. It also indicates a different school or group from any we've seen before, a fighting style completely unfamiliar to us. With its hand-to-hand -hand nature, it's possible that this could be related to Hora Lu, but I think it's more likely that it's our Elden Ring equivalent of the Senpu monks that this move originates from. Finally, the knight who he's kicking seems like one of those tough, plumed helmet knight enemies who normally use spears and swords in the base game, except this one has a twin blade. It seems like even the basic repeated faction enemies are going to have new variations and movesets. This gigantic fiery pot is... Well, I think it's a craftable throwing item, but it could also be a weapon under a throwable class, like the knives, which could be completely absurd and also really funny. Alternatively, it could be a weapon art, but I can't think of what kind of weapon it'd be the weapon art of unless we smash things with a giant pot and threw it as a weapon art. There isn't much I can comment on for this very cool fellow and his fully automatic crossbow but his armor is in a style that we haven't really seen in Elden Ring pretty much at all, with this very edgy style similar to gothic armor, with its lack of colorful ornamentation and simple angular plating, suggesting that he's either a one-off NPC we find from a distant land, or that we're getting some sort of faction that revolves around this more simple gothic style. Frankly, I don't know what to make of this spell at all, other than it's probably crucible related with the horn sprouting from the bear's head. It seems to be akin to Grail's roar, channeling a beast via communion to temporarily transform into one. I'm assuming that this isn't the only bear related spell we get. We may potentially fight a beast like this in game, acquiring some of its moves later on just as we do dragons. Next we see these two player characters fighting. We know the red dancer is an NPC and not an enemy since you can see the end of their role at the very start of the shot. More interestingly, this dancer has a unique moveset with her curved swords, which could possibly make it one of the newly introduced weapon categories. 
I believe that this may be a new paired curved sword weapon type, which may also include the reverse grip swords we saw earlier on. Each weapon could have more unique Ashes of War and individual movesets while maintaining the curved sword archetype of having two weapons at once. This moveset is incredibly similar to the Grave Wardens, not the Duelist of Elden Ring, but the curved sword wielding Hollows in Dark Souls 3. In one of the final shots, we get to see a dueling shield, as many have pointed out in the community. It's possible that it'll have different functions when held in different hands, though that's purely speculation. We also see a Tarnished holding the Dueling Shield alongside a Twin Blade. It isn't confirmation that the power stance together, it's very possible that they won't, but the choice to have them together, and the fact that they both have blades on both ends, makes me think it's possible that they'll work in tandem somehow. I'd put this in the Crucible section, but it's not really part of any theory, so I think it's better suited here. The final shot of fan service we get is, of course, the iconic Crucible Knight Wing Attack. Somehow, I didn't process it at first, but the Tarnished isn't holding any seal. This pretty much confirms to me that the wings are going to be an Ash of War, which makes sense, making them applicable specifically to swords and bladed weapons. This does make me worried though, as Ordovis and Siluria's weapons already have unique ashes. This means it's possible we won't be able to use the wings on the actual Crucible Knight weapons. Then again, it's always possible that it could be similar to Golden Vow, which functions as both an Ash of War and a spell. Now that we're over some of the most spectacular parts of the trailer, let's move on to places that I'm purely speculating about rather than having a solid amount of confidence in my claims. This section starts with this odd place that looks like where the Jar Warriors may be forged and delivered. We know that the Warriors are tasked with carrying their insides to minor Erd trees to be absorbed, hence why they're always around the minor Erd trees in the base game. But with this land, there may not be any minor Erd trees around. So, what are these jars here for? Are jar warriors born in the first place? Could the jars be used for something else, like transporting the sap that drips from the tree? Alternatively, they could serve an opposite purpose. The pots may simply serve as burial pots, holding the dead as their final resting place. Moving on to a different area, let's focus on this lava room for a moment. I have three suggestions for this place specifically. One could be related to the last area, being the actual forge of the Jar Warriors. Two, this is the only time we see an area like this, and the lava sort of reminds me of the lava in some late game heroes graves meaning our little side dungeons could have new gimmicks and spectacles. Or three, it could be the inner layer of Mesmer's location, maybe some sort of lava fortress. As I'll discuss later on, Mesmer does seem to have ties to Rykard in some way, and this place definitely feels straight out of Volcano Manor. Taking a few steps back, let's focus in on this shot I mentioned earlier, with the two individuals fighting, one in samurai armor, the other in a red dress. In the background, we can see a field of glowing blue flowers. It doesn't look like any other location in the trailer, and as we get this panning shot of it, we can see there's a couple of large tombstones across the place, similar to the ones we can find in Altus Plateau, on the path towards Lanedale. They can also be found in the Morn Moan Grave. They're unique in that they have a hole within them, with fingerprint markings around the hole. It's difficult for me to piece together exactly what they mean, but I don't think it should be entirely discounted because of how rarely this asset is used. Could it be possible that they indicate the influence of the fingers? Literally making a hole in death in its symbols. Perhaps the power granted to the fingers and their holding back of death is a literal violation, a vandalism of these graves. One aspect of this DLC that is very apparent is how littered it is with symbolisms for and against the Crucible. For example, let's look at that castle from the beginning of the trailer, and I want to draw attention to the top part of the fortress, which seems to be crumbling against gravity. It's somewhat reminiscent of Farah Missoula to me, with its floating rocks, which may be tied to a character we see later on. All of that essentially implies that this is a place where more primordial forces still reign. The ancient beasts of Farah Missoula may have come from here. In this shot with the swords being held backwards, the Tarnished is attacking some strange creatures with elongated necks and bodies, sprouting omen horns. 
They're the first time we see Omen with this kind of body type. The horns aren't just sprouting from regular humans, but from many other creatures. In its hand is a candle, already making it somewhat heretical to the Erd Tree with fire being profane. And notably, we can see the candle shape elsewhere in the trailer. Specifically, we see the shape on our freaky painting man, suggesting that he's similarly crucible related. The thing embedded within him that he's pulling out is weird to say the least. It's like a tree's branches, or more specifically, the legs of a centipede. If you take note of the black knife, which is a corrupted blade of calling, you'll see that it's sprouted extra centipede leg-esque branches. I think it's possible that this man was impaled by a regular spear initially, and the weapon piercing through him was corrupted, growing into a similar shape. After all, it doesn't seem possible that this man could have been pierced by this object as it is, especially with the large branches on the side. There's a few other interesting crucible bits lightly touched on or briefly shown in the trailer. For example, I believe this connection between the crucible and death, as potentially indicated by the sprouting black knife and the weapon embedded into Painting Man, is demonstrated again with this strange hippo-like creature. After charging at the player, it sprouts thorns with what looks like an aerial attack. It even fires out some kind of projectile that I presume could rain down on the player, similar to Elden Beast's wing projectile spears attack. The sound it makes when these thorns protrude from its body confirms that it's a crucible spell, and we can see that we can cast the same thing in website screenshots. More notably though, the thorns feel reminiscent of the thorns that sprout from the player when inflicted by death blight. Not to mention that the creature's color scheme already reflects death blight, being black and yellow. This, alongside the parallels between the crucible candles, the black knives, and the painting man's strange condition, make me think that death as a whole serves as an opposite to the crucible. It makes sense, after all, that the spread of death would be in opposition to uncontrolled primordial life. I think that this lion boss is going to be a major part of this area, since the color and the look of its arena seems to match quite well. What's very, very notable is that this lion is not a lion. It is a Chinese lion dance. It is so subtle in the shots they gave that I did not put it together until someone else mentioned it. You can see the head is being propped up by humanoid hands in every shot. The foot that slams down in this shot is just like Morgoth's omen foot. The way they stand up is extremely similar to how lion dancers stand up, propping up on each other to simulate the lion standing on its hind legs. You can actually see them under the cloak during their breath attack, and you can see that the bottom legs don't follow the head perfectly, instead moving first to control the movement of the dance. In its lightning attack, it is clear that the lion head doesn't seem to be participating or matching with the lightning jump meaning one of the dancers inside is the one casting the lightning. While still on the topic of lions, this lion head is more than just a mask. First of all, it's a beast, like the lion guardians we find across the game, and much like Sarash. It's definitely linked to Faramazula in some way, with the lightning incantations of one of its riders, and its bestial breath being reminiscent of Malaketh. But much more interestingly, statues in some shots show lions with these horns. This is a place where the crucible is still considered a blessing rather than being reviled. And I think that's what this city is entirely. A place wild and free from the systematic slaughter of the omen in the lands between. At first glance, I thought this thing to be a major story boss, but upon seeing the attached website screenshots, this thing seems to be escorted by soldiers, similarly to the giant carriages in the base game. This makes me think that they may be some sort of recurring boss. We very clearly fight them in the open world. It's got briars on its wrists, like the briars of the fire monks, and it's the most straight-up fiery-looking thing in the trailer. 
In an interview, Miyazaki states that the golem, quote, was a terrible weapon used in a war that occurred in the Land of Shadow. This leads me to think that it might be Mesmer's Flame specifically, which, as we'll discuss at the end of this, likely consists of multiple sources. It also should be noted that the kindling inside of it is not charcoal, but bodies. One part of this bizarre golem's design might even look familiar, hanging from its leg. It's a little hard to see, but just below its belt of branches is the head of a fire giant. And like many other things in the trailer, the central face of this monster is decorated with omen horns. It's a very cool design, likely inspired by myths like the Wicker Man with its caged torso. It is strange how many times different groups of worship and factions seem to intertwine in this DLC. The Briars and the Crucible aren't something I'd normally put together, and yet, just as Mesmer's design later on shows, the heretical seems to merge together, just as the Golden Order did with the sorcerers of Rhea Lucaria. In the shot with the giant throwing pot, we can see these enemies, who appear to be wearing some sort of big iron masks. They seem to be the same ones escorting the Wicker Man, they look almost like they're wearing the Prisoner Starting Class mask, which was created to stifle and torment its wearer. More notably, a central plate is in the center of the middle enemy's chest piece, which parallels the Eye of the Fell God that sits within the giant's chests. The shields of the men flanking him are circles surrounded by eight other small shapes, which very closely resemble the eight circles that surround the Eye of the Fell God in the Fire Giant cutscene. These seem to be survivors of the old war the Wicker Man was used in, likely worshippers of the Fell Flame. They could be seen as akin to the Fire Monks, though while those monks seem more associated with blood in Briars, as is the Wicker Man, these soldiers seem more focused on the fire of the Giants. They're definitely tied in some way, given the presence of the Fire Monks in the mountaintops, though what links them is yet to be seen but I think a certain character may shed light on that. Mother, wouldst thou truly lordship sanction in one so bereft of light? Mesmer is a character that is already full of so many questions. His design feels like it takes a little from everything. The easiest thing to note is that his name starts with an M, and he has red hair making him a child of Merica and Radagon, which is probably the only obvious thing about him. He has snakes on him, red snakes, which immediately ties him to Rykard, the Volcano Manor, and the Inquisition. His visual language shows that he is in opposition to the Erd Tree. Much like the Nameless King, his weapon seems to be some sort of sword spear, and take note of the Golden Hilt. You can see that this golden hilt very closely resembles Moog's spear, with its golden, almost semi-circle-like shape, down to the additional adornments of gold that jut out from its surface. Also like Moog's spear, the blade is black. This implies the fire he wields may not just be destined death, but other kinds of fire, such as blood flame. A weird discrepancy, though, is that Mesmer's spear looks completely different in the key art where there seems to be a second semicircle embedded within its ornamentation. This spear in this artwork in particular is almost one-to-one -one with Tattoo 28 in the character creation menu, which hasn't been given an in-game counterpart or connection yet whatsoever. It's strange that only the artwork seems to line up with this, indicating that it's either cut content or some sort of art discrepancy. Turning back to the flame that Mesmer wields, Though they are black and red, tendrils or branches seem to grow out of it, more reminiscent of the visuals of Death Blight. Though the fire attacks we see later do have that black and red, the attack explodes in what looks more akin to regular fiery magma, and a brighter color that can be seen as blood flame. This makes me think that it's some twisted imitation of Destined Death, making use of something like blood flame and death blight, or possibly the Giant's Flame, or Rykard's Taker's Flames. It could also relate to the Blood Star mentioned in the Thorn Sorceries, which we know are related to the Fire Monks. In a voice line, Mesmer refers to a mother, 
asking her if she would truly grant lordship to one bereft of light. I think this sounds like some sort of jealous cry against the tarnish. If he were cast out and removed from history to a point where we never hear of him at all until the Shadowland ourselves, why would she allow mere tarnished to become lords? Alternatively, the line could be referring to himself, pondering whether one as heretical as himself could truly become a lord. There are two additional things about him that only make him more confusing. One, he's participating in dragon communion of some sort. That much is clear, he has one very clear, very yellow reptilian eye. His armor is essentially that of the Drake Knights, minus the Omen Horns. He has the exact same chainmail with a red cloak above it, and dragon wings that don't just emerge from his armor, but seem to actively grow. You can see in this shot that the wings literally grow from one of the snakes. It's very possible that he's mid-transformation, and that the wings and the snakes aren't mere accessories or pets, but actually a part of his body, much like Gwendolyn's serpents. Strangely, the only things from the Drake Knight set that are absent on Mesmer's body are the Omen Horns. So, he's tied, somehow, to Dragon Communion, to Volcano Manor, to Death Blight, to Blood Flame, all while almost certainly being a sibling to Mikola and Melania. And yet, despite all of this, he addresses Merica, his mother, with what feels like reverence, and stands in front of what has effectively been confirmed as a statue of her. Those stripped of the race of gold shadow death. In a later voice line, he says that those who are stripped of grace of gold shall all meet death in the embrace of Mesmer's flame. This is the second confusing thing. His imagery is all heretical, in opposition to the Erd Tree and to the Golden Order. And yet the line he says sounds almost like it's from a worshipper, from a loyal follower, if you will. This has many potential meanings. Perhaps he is not willingly in the state he is now, merely bearing all of these different heretical states and flames for the sake of holding them back. Perhaps he is a mere tool of Merica who serves as a jailer, perhaps needing all of that power to keep Mikola contained. The idea that Mesmer could be a tool for Merica is supported by one of the most easily missed things about him, his eye. His left eye appears to be sealed shut, a very familiar sight. Melina and Rani are both split, souls without true bodies, both have their left eye shut. To note, Rani's spirit face mirrors the doll she inhabits. My assumption is that the true shut eye is the left one. While I think they could be indicators of their disembodied nature, it feels more likely to me that they seal some sort of secret. Mesmer, being bodiless, doesn't appear to match up to the fact that we can, well, fight. I think Mesmer's closed eye is hiding something about him, like how Melina hides her connection to destined death, and how Ronnie's betrays her role in the Night of the Black Knives, the shape of Godwin's wound manifesting below her eye. My theory, given the abundance of more niche schools of magic and beings unrelated to the Golden Order, is that this is a realm free of the Erd Tree's influence, and grace in general. I initially thought that Mikola conceived the world, but Miyazaki, in an interview, said the following. Another axis of the story is Queen Merica and what she did in the Land of Shadow, and what led Mikola to follow her there. It is a primordial world, occupied by those who were here before, but were still rejected when the lands between as we know them came into the power of the Golden Order. As we know, Merica came to this land, and it was where she became a god, and specifically where the Erd Tree was born. I believe this is where a dark truth lies. We see omen, we see beasts, we see gravity sorcery, we see the fell flame, and many others that are not primarily adjacent to the teachings of the Golden Order that are tied to the Erd Tree. Mesmer is a child of Merica and Radagon, and he seems like he was cast out, removed from the annals of history much like the Nameless King was. 
He carries the aesthetics of multiple things, all of which are heretical to the Golden Order in some way. Though I can't place his exact role in the story, I think he'll represent the Shadowlands as a whole, a place cast aside and hidden from the rest of the lands between by a veil, a place cast aside after its usefulness was outlived, a place that Merica didn't want remembered. The Crucible and Death feel interlinked in some way, and it's the Crucible that seems to be appearing throughout. In the money shot, you can actually see that there are two trees that overlook the Land of Shadows, with one tree being squeezed by the other, draining sap into a tower at its base. This sap is discussed in the Blessed Dew Talisman. And yet, contrary to the talisman's descriptions, it seems that sap still drips from the central tree. It's possible that this tree is the real Erd tree, a tree hidden away for whatever reason and replaced with, you guessed it, an illusion. Look closely at these two trees. They're black, lacking in many leaves. Could they be burnt? Look around Lanedell before we even burn the Erd tree. Why does ash already cover so much of its ground? Consider the name given to this world, the Land of Shadow they call it. Perhaps it functions as a shadow-bound beast does, a world confined and bound out of its own control existing for specific purposes. I think it's very possible that someone burnt this old Erd tree, sending ash across Landell and setting the stage for the Golden Order. And given how we have a brand new character, one associated with every kind of fire deemed heretical, I don't think it'd be a stretch to say that the culprit was Mesmer the Impaler. I suggest that Mesmer burnt the old Erd tree and Merica banished him and everything associated with him to the Land of Shadow, deeming the fires he wielded as heretical. Whether Merica had a hand in the burning is up to debate, but given how this was the land where she ascended to godhood, I don't think it'd be much of a stretch. If Merica was capable of using her shadow as a tool, casting Malaketh aside after he served his purpose, I don't think it'd be far off to suggest she'd do the same to an entire realm of shadow. I suggest that Mesmer's heretical imagery was not always seen as that way, and that we only see it as such because of the teaching we've already been shown throughout the game. Teaching spread by the current order. This is not a solid theory. We have to consider when Mesmer was born, being a child of Radagon. We have to consider when Radagon came about, whether he was always part of Merica or what kind of world Godfrey ruled in, but it's my theory nonetheless. So with this theory in mind, what is Mikola's role in all this? One of the first new armor sets we see is this one, and as a friend pointed out, this looks like it could be a Mikolan Knight set. The combination of silver and gold colors reflect the Mikolan Knight's sword, and similarly to that sword, it seems that it appropriates the aesthetics of the Carrions, where gold and silver are combined alongside precious stones within the blades and armor. The ring that this Mikolan Knight stands over could be the Ring of Mikola, a gesture you get from pre-ordering the game, and as a friend suggested, could serve as the DLC's version of Sights of Grace. Mikola, in the ending of the trailer, stands before the trees, the top part white and colorless, like in the Duskborn ending, while the baldachins that draped over the land are gone. I think that Mikola is either responsible for draining the sap from the tree, or, more likely in my eyes, he is seeking to free it from this process. It is possible that this is what keeps the Golden Order in its perpetual state of idle power, and that this is what Mikola is trying to break with our help. Or perhaps it is what prevents the Eclipse and what prevents Godwin from dying a true death, being a source of death blight. It could be all of these options. It could be that the veil hangs over this tree, and the other tree that strangles it keeps it in stasis. Perhaps it's maintaining a status quo. The same status quo throughout the lands between. If Mikola is removing the baldachin like I suspect he is. He could possibly be trying to do for the tree what he plans to do for Godwin. 
Perhaps Mikola's goal is to give this herd tree a true death, to break stasis and to allow life to progress, freeing the many schools of heresy from the Shadowland and releasing them into the world. And to do that, of course, he needs our help. I think that the feminine voice we hear at the end is his, or perhaps Saint Trina's, guiding us to him to help him achieve this goal. I genuinely don't believe Mikola's intentions to be malicious, despite how cold and calculating I expect him to be. As we follow in his footsteps, he'll be using us to achieve this goal, to allow everything to flourish, be it graceful or malign. Come now, touch the withered arm, and travel to the realm of shadow. I will not be far behind. May we meet again.